Hiya, Mary Murphy here from Maynooth University, and I'm speaking to you today about work and welfare. What I want to do is just introduce you to some basic concepts to help us think about how work, welfare, care and employment work across women's life cycle. Then I want to talk about a couple of problems. I want to then talk about some possible solutions and then I'll give you some takeaways. I'm hoping that what I say will be connected in some way to previous things you've heard from Helen Russell, Damien Grimshaw and Pauline Cullen in previous sessions. I think it's very useful, even though we're only going to talk about welfare today, it's really important to remember that welfare interacts with other policy areas, particularly with employment policy and with policies relating to gender and care in particular. So even though we're focusing on welfare, it's really important to understand how it works with other policies and that's what often creates traps. It's important too to think about how women experience welfare policy and work throughout their life cycle. So from young women who might leave school early with low skills and immediately enter low paid and segregated employment, but also young college graduates women often find that they begin to enter gender segregated occupations and have an early gender pay gap too. Many young women will find themselves young mothers, either as lone parents or as in couples, and they'll find their pathways limited by care barriers, and they're often restricted to quite local labour markets because of care. For women who are re-entering work after maternity, they may find discrimination based on that maternity and find it difficult to re-enter. And for women who may spend some years at home in early childcare years, they will find as they go to re-enter the labour market that there will be entry barriers. They might end up on lower pay and lower status work than they had previously. And for older women, they too will experience re-entry discrimination as they try and get back into work. So for all of these reasons, we see pension gaps emerging at the very end of the life cycle. And what we see is women who had poor employment records and were low paid workers during the early years of their life cycle will end up as poorer pensioners too. Now, a lot of these inequalities stem from the male breadwinner nature of our social welfare system, which brings about gendered inequalities. And I'm particularly referring here to the means tested social assistance, household payments. And the way those income and means tests works is they limit the amount of payment a household can get, not to two adult payments, but to 1.7% of two adult payments. So that means that the second person in the household, often the woman, isn't fully recognised as a full adult in, in her own right. That can have disincentives for her as a second earner. And there are also disincentives if the family are accessing income tested in work benefits as well. So the way the way male breadwinner works is that there may be up to 100,000, I and mean, I call them invisible women, women who are qualified adults in the social welfare system with no social insurance record in their own right, no PRSI, no employment supports, and that leads them into pension poverty. So I think the solution there is about individualizing welfare payments and employment supports as a right and in practice. I think likewise, when we look at the tax system, we also see a similar male breadwinner structure. There is a household assessment structure with some partial individualization, but women often transfer their tax credits in joint household assessment systems. And again, this undervalues women's potential economic contribution and acts as a disincentive for the second earners. The tax credits don't depend on a woman having a care role, simply on being a wife. And this reinforces wifely labor rather than values care and uh, compensates for care. So again, I think the answer here is about individual in tax credits and linking them better to care. The other problem I want to identify is the kind of employment services that are offered. Pathways to work is our activation strategy. It's how we imagine people and help people move from welfare to work. But it's a very careless strategy. It doesn't take account of care in its operations and its policies. So, for example, it obliges lone parents whose children are 14 years or over to take up full time work. And this means that the women are obliged to work like a man, but to continue caring like a woman, as Jill Rubri would say. 
Neither does the policy recognise the need of all women to access employment supports and enabling programmes to help them get back to work. It needs to recognise part-time work as a valid choice and enable it. All of these things sort of work together to create a number of traps for women. And whilst we have a lot of good jobs in Ireland, a number are precarious jobs or low paid jobs. And we see a lot of different types of traps, the kind of male breadwinner trap I referred to earlier, the low learning trap, in work poverty traps, the triple shift trap of childcare, domestic work and poor quality part-time work. And all of this leads into a precarious trap for women where they might often churn between welfare and work. And that's what we want to try and avoid. So how do we avoid this? What do we do? The National Economic and Social Council on the November 18th uh, launched the future of the Irish social welfare system, participation and protection. And that gives us quite a lot of tools through which we can think about what we need to do. But I think before we think about what we need to do, we need to know where we're trying to get to. And I think this feminist model of care, work and welfare helps us to do this. It offers four different ways of thinking about how men and women share work and care. In stage one, the man works, the woman cares. In stage two, the woman is still the primary carer, but the man work, but she works a little. In stage three, both adults work and care tends to have to be purchased in the marketplace. What I want to argue is that we want to get to stage four where a feminist care ethic is accommodated in the design of the labour market and the welfare system. Both adults work less than full time and both adults share care more equally. And I think such a vision can animate the kind of policy that we need to try and implement. So that gives us maybe a practical way of how do we move towards that. We need to activate all state policy, as I've said, employment policy, care policy, but particularly welfare policy in this instance. And I think there's some really practical things that we can do. For example, the NEST report talks about a participation income pilot where a social assistance payment is made available to people for socially valued work, including care. So at the moment, we insist that the only participation that's valid is paid employment and people need to prove that they are seeking paid employment to be eligible for a job seekers payment. The participation income suggests a wider range of things could be valued in the types of participation people do in order to be um, entitled to a welfare payment. That's one clear thing. The other is to individualize the social welfare system, to move away from the idea of it being a male breadwinner system, and particularly this area of the total welfare payment being limited, whereby a limitation rule means the couple can only access 1.7% of the adult to adult payments. There is a mechanism in the social welfare system, a job seekers transition payment. And again, the NESC report recommends that qualified adults, these invisible women in the welfare system, should be able to come more visible through accessing a job seekers transition payment in their own right. I think the other thing that we need to do is to think about enabling activation supports for all. So the Pathways to Work strategy, Ireland's activation strategy, is very much fo only focused on those people who are on a job seekers payment. It doesn't open up wide enough to other people who may need it, who are maybe not in the social welfare system or who are qualified adults. So making supports, public employment services, active labour market measures, available for everybody is something that we really need to think about doing. And the fourth thing that I'd like to recommend is that we need to do better at recognising and facilitating atypical and part-time work. At the moment, flexible employment is really flexible employment from the perspective of the employer. What we need to try and do is develop our employment regulations and our welfare regulations so that both support decent long hours part-time work that can really help to facilitate the work and care choices that many women and men want to make. So I gave the example earlier on that lone parents, once their children are a certain age, are obliged to seek full-time work. I think we could change that relatively easy to mean that they have to engage in seeking a range of employment and that part-time work is a valid choice in that. 
the diagram you can see there, activating the state, suggests there are three things we need to think about. An effective and flexible social welfare system that really does value care and accommodates people to choose a combination of work and care that works in their own lives. Leg two shows that the activation processes need to enable people to find decent work and it needs to give people the kind of work experience and training and education that they need to really find a sustainable job that works for them and gives them some well-being in their lives. While leg three refers to the need to focus in employment policy on creating decent jobs. Now there are a lot of very good jobs in Ireland and we should be thankful about that but 30% of jobs are low paid. And there are many that don't give sufficient hours for people to be able to get a meaningful income from it. So long hours of part-time work are more preferable to, than to very scrappy, short time part-time jobs. And really the part-time jobs that are low paid, we need to think about how we can ratchet up the payments of those jobs to make them more meaningful as jobs. A lot of them are around care, there's 26, a thousand jobs supported by the childcare industry and they, they could be a, a focus for how we increase pay in that sector, for example. So I think all in all, there's very practical things that we can do, um, but I think we need to be animated by that vision of a care ethic informing our policy design where we're trying to create a society where men and women share both paid employment and care work more equally. So I leave it at that. I hope it wasn't too quick, and if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. <laughs>